Next is Luke and I, and we're going to be talking about wildlife management for, uh, you know, not, not so much the agronomy guys, but more the specialty crops. But Luke's got a lot of fascinating information he's collected here today that he's going to share, and uh, I'll let you take it away. Is the audio working? All right, you guys can hear me okay? Good. Uh, well, thank you, Chris, and uh, I like to start these. We just gave a similar talk at the, uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, at the uh, for Small Fruit and Vegetable uh, Conference up there. Uh, so we get to do it again, and it's great because I kind of bring some of the academic side of things, and Chris really brings a lot of the on-the-ground experience and working in the field. So I think it's a good partnership to tag team this topic. Um, so as an overview, some of you guys, my guys and gals might deal with this, uh, this little critter right here, but we'll talk about identifying the species, what other species you have to worry about, uh, and spend the, really the bulk of the time talking about management, what can we do to manage uh, damage. Uh, and take an integrated pest management approach. We'll talk about four main categories for ways you can deal with wildlife damage. And um, they are important to think about because not everybody can do the same thing on each farm. Some people are fine to use hunting as a tool. Some people might have houses surrounding their farm and not be able to use that tool as easily. So we'll talk about all the different options. Some are more effective and some are less effective. So just like to go through briefly and talk about some broad identification of damage just so you can make sure you're targeting the right culprit. But here are the, a lot of the culprits you might uh, find here in Maryland. Um, here on the Eastern Shore, by far deer are the biggest um, percentage driver. This is a 2012 study by the USDA. And deer ends up being about 80% of the damage across the state, followed by geese, and then groundhogs, bear, and other species. So um, we'll talk a little bit about deer, groundhogs, um, maybe some raccoons, rabbits, beer, uh, voles, beavers, and other things like that. So if you don't catch them in the act, what do you do? You look for clues. Um, one of the things is tracks or scat, um, and we'll talk mostly about damage characteristics um, because you don't necessarily know if the scat was left there while that damage was happening. But there's some nice characteristics of, uh, that you can help to know uh, the difference between what's causing your damage. And this is kind of an example I like to give. Deer and rabbits are two pretty common damage causers, and a lot of times uh, people see the deer and they might not see the rabbits, and so they might be blaming deer for rabbit or, or vice versa. But here's an easy way to kind of remember, and I'll try to give an example of why. But you see this leaf right here is jagged and torn off, whereas these are sheared off almost with a knife. So, and these are ornamental plants, but it's an example just because it shows that sort of behavior. Um, so on the left we have deer and on the right it's rabbit. So how do you remember that? Well, not switch it up when you're in the field. It's been two weeks since this talk and you're like, which one was which? Um, this might help you remember. Um, for those of you who have ever uh, worked a lot with ungulates, uh, they actually don't have any front incisor teeth on the top. So they actually grab things with their gums off the, off the top between their bottom teeth and their gums and they rip uh, vegetation off. So it's a ripping action. That's why you get that jagged behavior. And this applies to cows, deer, sheep. All our ruminants have no top front teeth. Um, rabbits, on the other hand, here's a skull of a rabbit and they have these um, sharp teeth in the top and the bottom. So they're able to shear that off real clean. So that's just an easy way to maybe help you remember which is which. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, deer biology. Um, this is a, a chart of energetic needs. This is adapted from a livestock, uh, from a cow's um, energy needs. So this brown is the maintenance requirements to keep a cow or a deer alive year, year round. And this is going to be a female doe. And this pink section here is the energy required to, to grow a fawn in, in, the, in the womb. And this, is, this blue line marks birth. And then the blue additional chunk here is the energy required for lactation of that fawn. So the energetic needs are really stacking up when after that fawn is even born in terms of lactation energy costs. So something to keep in, keep in mind when you see all of a sudden there's a lot of deer grazing, this you basically have like your population energetic needs really can increase by 50%, sometimes more even. Um, I'll also briefly show some deer activity, what we saw in soybean fields here at the Y. Um, and just to show kind of like, well, what's happening? You see deer out there, but this was actually really interesting to me when we put this onto a chart. 
But all these, this is, we had 10 game cameras out for this uh, study on different varieties of soybeans. And the height of these bars is how many pictures were taken every day of deer in these fields. And uh, the blue part of the bar is grazing or pictures taken at night. And the gold is pictures taken during the day. So you can quickly see most of this is happening at night. So you think about, OK, if 70% of our damage is happening at night, what do we do to manage that? Another thing that I saw, and, and I, this is why being an extension is so great, giving these talks is so great. I get information from all of you guys and thinking about this. Somebody asked me at the Talbot Corn Club presentation a year ago, I said, what's causing these spikes? Because about half the damage is happening in those four, four or five nights of heavy grazing. And I was like, gosh, let's analyze that. So we popped in some rainfall data uh, that I'll talk about in just a minute. I have some more slides on this. Um, so I'll back up also to identifying different types of damage. Sorry, that slide was kind of popped up too early. It should have been a little later. Um, this, uh, this, also, this cleaned off um, twig cutting can happen as well. This is rabbit. Now you can also see some cleaned off uh, twigs like this on the right. But these are actually two different species. Uh, this one on the right is beaver damage. If you're close to a waterway, beaver will come out 100, 200 feet out of the creeks and rivers and come up onto the dry ground and can do some of this types of damage too. So if it's larger sized twigs, it might look like it's cleanly sheared off, but obviously it's um, not a rabbit taking out that large a thing. So beavers will get into your crops. Uh, a local farmer uh, around here had a uh, beaver piling up corn stalks and making a, a dam um, out of corn. So uh, groundhogs can be pretty uh, Impactful. This is a picture of some damage of groundhogs from the air on the Y Angus side of our farm, just right across the water. And so they can cause localized, pretty, you know, serious losses. Bark damage. Uh, there are two main culprits for bark damage. One is rabbit, which is here on the left. The other is voles. I don't hear a lot of people with a lot of vole problem here. It seems to be more in Western Maryland and the, on the Piedmont um, side of things. But one way to tell the difference between voles and rabbits is, especially in the winter, the rabbits will be caught gnawing above the snow line while the voles will actually be beneath, they'll be burrowing under the snow. And we can talk about tr ways to deal with voles and rabbits too. Underground root damage uh, on your tubers, things that are sheared off like a pencil. Um, this is classic uh, kind of uh, vole behavior as well. A lot of people might think it is a mole because moles are also burrowing underground, but moles are actually eating grubs. They are meat eaters. They don't eat vegetation. So it's probably your voles. They will strip the roots and leave these pointed tips like in that picture before. So I want to get to the bulk of what we're here for. So kind of just give a broad overview, but it's the management side of things and sort of integrated, integrated approach. And I've found four main categories that we can talk about for managing uh, wildlife damage. Habitat and vegetation, like manipulating habitat to make it less likely or to attract animals to a certain place. Fencing, which I think is probably one of the most effective, although again, it depends on your situation. Repellents, um, I would put repellents in that same kind of category of like habitat, which we'll, we'll get into. Um, it can work, it helps, it's not a cure-all, it does have drawbacks and then lethal control, which is also um, can be helpful too. So we'll start with habitat and vegetation. Um, so think about, depending on your species that you're dealing with, what are the, um, the needs of that species? For example, if you've got a lot of rabbit damage, uh, they love that brushy cover to hide out in. They stay away from predators and escape predators. So if you want to get rabbits away from a certain area where they're causing damage, you might want to clear out that brushy cover. Voles like taller grass and mulched areas, so mowing, uh, weeding, spraying around your areas so there's uh, a, a low-lying vegetation. They don't like to come out in the open. There, there are lots of little hawks and predators that are happy to take them out. So changing that habitat of grass, tall grass, helps to keep them away. Deer tend to like palatable broadleaf plants. They also like forests. They hide out in the forest and brushy areas and they come out on the field edges. So if you have something really valuable, put it further away from the field edges. Um, and also we'll talk, and you can attract them 
put things preferred for them close to those field edges, which we'll talk a little bit about too. And for geese, uh, they need space to take off. So you can actually manipulate that habitat. We found here pretty effective tools of just putting those um, electric fence step-in stakes in a lot of places around the field so they can't glide in and land gently. If you put them every 10, 10 15 feet scattered across a field, they need room to be able to run to take off and to co come in and coast down and they don't like to have all these poles sticking up. So that's a little trick that's worked pretty well for geese. Um, in terms of attracting or diverting deer away, uh, here's a picture of a spring food plot um, that I planted. There's some great guides. Uh, Craig Harper at the University of Tennessee has some great uh, publications to give you ideas on how to do food plots. Basically what you're doing is, yeah, creating a food plot to put the, get the deer to go where you want them to go and not in your crops. Uh, there are a few main categories. There are cool season perennials, clover, alfalfa, and chicory. Um, I would say some of these are, are nice in that they're low maintenance. They can last a few years, uh, but they're also working mostly in those cool season times. They might be preferred for helping you with your lethal control options and your hunting programs. Uh, there are cool season annuals that also work really well. I found winter pea seems to be a very highly preferred uh, species. And then you have your warm season uh, crops, which might be best if you're growing something. You, have, you want your deer out of the growing season. Uh, soybeans are probably the highest food plot item on a deer's uh, palate, although there's others like corn, cow peas, iron clay cow peas have seen some preference for them, lab lab. American Joint Fetch, and there's, these are all described in this publication, and you can learn more about the sort of pros and cons of these different types of things. So here's that slide that I showed you earlier, and, and I was setting it up to like, what is causing these big spikes? We pulled up the precipitation data for, from the farm for this year. This is 2021 summer. And we found when I charted it, we started seeing these rainfall events happening about a day or two. We'd have these big spike rainfall events right before these spikes of grazing. Um, and I thought, gosh, how do we do statistics to do this? Um, and there's a tool called cross correlation functions um, where it will, uh, your, the algorithm will look and see, is there a lag between the rainfall and these spikes of activity? And if the line goes above this blue line, it's, it signifies a significant relationship, that there's something happening there. Now, there's lots of grazing happening outside of this, but this is suggesting right here, uh, at about 50 hours um, after rainfall, you start seeing these big grazing spikes. 50 hours was significant, also about 30, 35 hours, you start seeing this activity. Now, that was just one year, and I was like, wow, it'd be really neat if we could see this happen again. Here's our data from 2022. We had a lot more cameras out. I was disappointed when I looked at this data. I was like, oh man, this is not nearly as spiky as we saw. We don't see the same patterns. I don't know if this is gonna hold again, but I plugged it into the model and we still had some highly significant effects happening. This time it was coming in about 30 to 48 hours um, after rainfall, we started seeing an increased grazing activity. So. If you're doing management, you're doing repellents, uh, you're thinking about temporary fencing or other things, you might want to target this period uh, right after your rainfall to, to get out there pretty quick to um, keep deer out of your areas. This is the two years combined showing that similar effect and um, looking forward to, to getting this published and, and out there. So fencing, now this is where Chris will be able to chime in a lot. I think fencing along with lethal control are probably, if you can do them and they work for your operation are, are probably more effective. These, I feel like habitat, vegetation, repellents sort of work on the edges, depending on what you got, they can help. But fencing can be really effective. Um, if you just have a small area, I don't know how many people have, just need to do single, single tree or small plantings. This is a 10, 10 foot diameter wire mesh cage um, that we've put up. And you can see the deer have grazed everything, but they will not go inside something smaller than 10 feet. You can get about 10 foot diameter. They don't want to jump into that because they, they can't see the back at where the back fence ends and the front one begins. They have very poor depth perception and they probably don't want to get inside that to feel trapped. So um, these are just step in stakes I described for those goose hunting or to keep geese out of the field um, and just wrap out 
10, uh, 30 feet of wire around them. But uh, there are other tools for larger areas to keep deer out. This is plastic mesh fencing. This is eight foot tall um, mesh fencing. It will work uh, to keep deer out. It's plastic, it's cheap, it's lightweight. Um, rabbits will chew right through it. So there's like pros and cons to all this stuff. But um, this is pretty effective. And I got another picture here. And this is a great publication out of Cornell. It talks about low cost fence designs where you can use existing trees to, so you don't have to put poles in the ground, depending on what you have here. Um, you can find this through Googling it. Um, but they have these examples of how do you protect your trees while you're putting up your fence. There's one wire uh, that basically holds it up at the top and um, highly recommend putting visual signals on the pl plastic mesh. It's, it's almost invisible sometimes when it's out in the forest and you don't see it. Humans can run into it, deer can and will run into it or run through it if they don't see it. Here's a fence we have on one of our areas at the Y and I'll let maybe Chris elaborate a little bit on this. Yeah, this one's electrically charged. It goes around some of our more specialty crop areas. Uh, we've got three fenced in areas. You can see we've got some apple trees there. I don't know if you can tell in the very back, you can see a little bit of white. That's where our row covers are. Uh, we've got blueberries, hops, we've got a vineyard inside here. Uh, Luke had a study in there for different, I guess, forage varieties of beans and other food that deer might be more attracted to. Um, but it's electrically charged and it's too short. The deer, they just jump right over it some days if there's something in there they really want. Every year, right in the springtime, we'll get a little bit of damage in the strawberries. It looks like somebody took a weed eater through there and you know, there's no more leaves, there's just the crown, there's no more flowers. So I'd like to make it taller, but you know, this fence is probably, you know, chest high right here at this corner post. And that's just, that's just not doing much, yes. Have you ever tried baiting it? Baiting it, yes, baiting works great. We, we really do that on uh, some of the poly tape fences, the temporary fences that we do, I really like using molasses. You go to the tractor supply, you get a gallon of molasses for $10, and you I usually put a rubber glove on so I'm not so sticky, but you just stick two fingers in and just you know keep wiping it on the fence. You've gotta do it after it rains to attract them. Don't stop doing it. A lot of people think once you do it for a week, you're done. Um, the guys have been putting in the past peanut butter and inside tin foil and they wrap that on there and that that you know the tin foil helps the peanut butter stay after it rains so there's a couple different things you can do i've had pretty good luck with molasses on my own um you know to the tune that you know in november when the bucks are running everywhere and the does can't find any relief they'll jump inside my strawberry patch you'll have five does inside the strawberry patch and seven bucks pacing the outside perimeter they can't figure out how to get in and we've been picking strawberries out there and you'll come up on a fawn that that's been placed in the strawberry patch i guess mom thinks it's safer in there because of how difficult it is to get in there so uh, that's just personal experience I haven't seen that here on the farm yet we do we do find fawns in the the fenced in area that has 10 foot fence and there's parts of the year we don't mow in there because you know, we don't want to run over any fawns that are laying in the grass that they don't move. So this is the drive through gate that we got. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's some wire strands that hang through. We try to really encourage deer to not walk through there. It, it does a pretty good job for the most part, but there's, keep in mind, there's also a ton of forage on the outside that's closer to the woods. That's easier for them to get to. All the agronomy guys complain, but you know, we're not going to fence the whole farm off, so. Getting and back to that forage thing, uh, uh, Luke, Chris, um, you're talking about planting wildlife crops. Well, you know, my experience is with, with win winter cover crops, that, that draws them in just like a wildlife crop would, so they just yep. go off all my winter cover crops. And yep. It's a huge problem. So it, if you're you... attracted in, so I don't, I don't know about planting it around the outside like this one. If, if you plant Austrian winter peas, crimson clover, uh, triticale, oats, th those four right there are really going to bring the deer in. The oats are the most 
palatable cereal raw you or cereal grade you can grow for hairy yeah hairy veg mm -hmm. is another one and turnips are you know any any of the canola varieties as soon as they get hit with so much cold weather you know things start tasting sweeter to deer and you know they're, they're coming in so yeah it can help and hurt you you know you can keep the problem around all the time we've got a lot of rye planted around here and i don't see deer really out grazing a lot of it they've done plenty of cafeteria studies at different universities and different organizations and uh rye's pretty low on the list so, for, you know, for deer like a rye, and it, it's often suggested rye hairy vetch mm -hmm. together so mm -hmm. maybe the rye could help. We've got it planted right here on the farm now. So and I don't see deer really grazing in those fields. So yeah. Yeah. Um, to come back for everybody else who has not tried uh, baiting electric fences, what we were talking about with the molasses is you put something really attractive for the deer on the electric fence oh, yes. so they come lick it, get zapped, and they learn to not try to touch it, they stay away from it. So a lot of times if you don't do that, they don't know what it is, they might be inclined to actually just run into it, run over it, knock it over and causes problems. But if they get trained through baiting, they, they touch their lick on, lip on, tongue on there and then they, uh, they get zapped and they learn that way. So that's what that process is for. And to the cover crop issue, we also, we planted a variety of cover crops um, and we found they were mostly, they real, I wish I, I have the chart, just not in this presentation, but they really hit our crimson clover and winter wheat mix the most, partly because there's a lot of biomass there for them. Mm -hmm. They did not hear, they don't seem to hit the brassicas, the rape and the turnip as hard. Um, the numbers were not nearly as much as we had in that clover wheat mix and in the winter pea, I think it's winter pea wheat mix as well. They liked those, but they really hit the crimson clover. I think because the biomass was just so, so high and it was really palatable. They like the winter pea. I just don't think it creates as much, as much uh, biomass. This is one of our, uh, we call it the cattle guard. You've got to drive over this to get into one of the areas with a much higher fence. Uh, I believe it's 22 or 23 feet wide. I can get a pretty wide disc and call the packer through there. You know, you, you've got to line up on the center bracket there with the center of the tractor when you're driving and Try not to look too much behind you, but you can slip through there with plenty of room. If you're, we built this here before my time. My suggestion, if you're gonna explore this option, build it big enough so you can expand with your equipment later if you upgrade or something. You know, Just make sure you build it with enough room to get through here. This area, we don't see the deer walk over the cattle guard. You can probably see some of the wires right in between. That's how the current is allowed to keep going. We do have to pull it out and clean it out. We've got to unhook from the fence on both sides, pull it out with the backhoe. We get a lot of mud that comes off the trucks, the tires, because it's, it's like a speed bump. So when you hit it, it can shake dirt off. You know, you're taking equipment to the field, from the field. We try, we've got a weed problem out here, uh, yellow nut sedge. We try to knock all the dirt off our equipment before we come out, but the pickup trucks seem to track it in and out anyway. So. Uh, um, yeah, there is a bit of maintenance with this. It's not terrible, but it's something to consider and build it big enough that you can expand your equipment that you're using and still get through. So, And this is on a wire fence that's probably eight feet tall. And you can mm -hmm. see we have uh, closer wires at the bottom for, de for deterrence, and then they get more spaced out as you go up. And mm -hmm. I, I need to get a, another picture of the full length of this fence, but it, you can actually see it on your drive out. Mm -hmm. um, and you can talk to us, we'll show you where it is. Yeah. Um, this is a cheap and much easier way to put up a temporary fence. Here's a picture of that baiting station that we were talking about earlier. You can put a piece of tin foil on there and put peanut butter on, or you can get your molasses and rub it on there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you, you can get everything this? here at Tractor Supply or on Amazon if you really want to try. But the posts, I've seen them anywhere from $1.50 to $3. Tractor supply, you can get a spool of half inch poly, you know, 600 or more feet on a spool. We do one line around, um, you know, we, we bait it aggressively, you know, that, that seems to take some of the labor of putting two strands and a secondary fence on the outside. You know, we've got pictures of that here in a minute, but as long as we're baiting it, I don't know if you can tell either, this time of year we would have had our bird netting on anyway 
uh, you know, to protect the clusters from, from birds, and we'll get into bird netting in a little bit. So the fence is doing something, but, you know, when, when, the, when the grape clusters are on and the bird netting's on, we tend to not worry about it and usually take it down because I'm in there spraying so much. And the deer also have other crops that they can switch over to and they're not willing to, to mess with grapes so much. Early in the season is when it seems that the grapes get hit the hardest when there's a lot of, you know, fluid moving up through the plant. That's when it seems that there's like three or four varieties in the middle of this study that, that they really like. So this is the, an example of what I was just talking about with the two fences. You can see the outer fence and the inner fence as you look right here. Uh, that kind of messes with their perception. They can't tell if they can jump over it, in between it. They just can't quite figure it out. You know, you get deer that get curious, don't get me wrong. That's where the molasses comes in. They really can't turn down molasses. Uh, and put it close together, you know, between posts, you can put it three or four times, put it on heavy where you see the, the wood line and everything. But um, uh, everybody in here knows how much we put into uh, financially, how much we put into specialty crops. This isn't my picture, but it's, a, it's from Clemson. It's a field of strawberries. Strawberries are expensive. They're tough enough to do anyway. We don't need deer running through the field, punching holes in the plastic, drip tape, eating the crop. So. This is a little more expensive than the last slide, but you know, if you work it out right, you can kind of rotate around and always use at least one or two legs of the fence that you're putting up. Uh, so the, it, maybe that can kind of cut some of the cost down for you. Is there any questions about this setup here? If you want to access a website that describes this, there's a little QR code. You can pull up your phone, take a picture of it, um, or feel free to reach out to any of us, either of us afterwards, and we can send you any of the publications on this that we mentioned. There's another example here of what do they got there? Some kind of trees it looks like, uh, you know, but birds, raccoons, squirrels, tons of things love these crops and seem to have a taste for it before it's quite sweet enough or quite soft enough for us um, you know we'll go down through the vineyard and we'll you know i'll walk out there with joe we'll taste grapes and everything and eh, this needs a couple more weeks or this needs a little more than that and you can see where the raccoons are trying to dig into the into the the bird netting to get at the clusters and the hornets the hornets are another big indicator that you know that's a whole nother topic of spraying uh but the hornets will just chew these grape clusters up long before you um uh, are ready to harvest them and they get stuck in this netting and sometimes you got to be pretty careful when you lift it up to do any kind of work. So it seems like wildlife around here likes to taste things before people are ready to taste things. So yes, yes. So here, here's a, a closer picture of our bird netting. You know, this is a task. We do it, you know, it's, it seems like we're doing it earlier and earlier because of it keeps the birds from nesting in the clusters and then I don't have to feel bad about closing the nest in. You know, that's a, that's, that's, I don't know, I guess an internal conflict, but, um, you know, we put this up. It's very important underneath to really cross the nettings, make sure that, you know, nothing can pull it apart and reach up in there. We use a ton of clips. We're very close to the woods and a marshy area. We attract a lot of raccoons. We usually are trapping for them uh, uh, throughout the year. So, but that's bird netting to keep the birds off your clusters because they will absolutely destroy your grapes. Uh, blueberries here, we have the deer fence around the outside all year. This time of year, we have a fence that's probably this high with, you know, four by four spacing in it. And then we have rabbit wire or chicken wire, or whatever you want to call it, uh, zip tied around that is another layer down low that's at least 30 inches high. Don't buy the two foot stuff. When you're standing tractor supply, buy the 36 inch stuff. I know it costs more money, but rabbits can jump. Uh, and I just, two, two feet, just, it's like, what is this? So they, they can get right over this. Um, you got to check the fences. You have to make sure nothing's trying to get up underneath of them. You know, we do a pretty good job that that uh, heavier 
primary fence that we zip tie the chicken wire to has enough weight that it keeps things down. You know, it, it, they can't get underneath it that as easy as they can just chicken wire and those white fence posts. Um, so you also see the structure. That's what we put our bird netting over in the summertime. And the rabbits, much like the deer at my strawberry patch, slip under there and just seem to go in there and hang out and uh, we've got to mow grass through there so much that putting the fence up around the outside would be a problem but i think the rabbits know that the hawks can't get in there and get them you know there's not a lot of predator pressure in there but um so it's really a all year long we're managing wildlife uh as they try and get in and out of the blueberries and uh that's a combination of the rabbit fencing the deer fencing and the, the large bird netting that goes over the top. Yes. Do you do any herbicide along that chicken wire fence? Yeah. We, we, the green stuff grows like crazy. So what we did this year was my first year, we did it the way they'd always done. We threw it over the top, it went down, and the grass grew up through the net pretty good. So what we did was we actually zip tied PVC pipe. We had some that laid out in the sun and nobody wants to use you know, PVC pipe to spin out in the sun, it's not gonna, it's brittle. So we wrapped it in there and we kind of came up with a curtain system with some baler twine that we can lift this up and put it down and it's a lot easier to get under there. And if you mow it frequently enough, the grass can't grow up through there. And I'm talking once a week, once every 10 days, depending on your rain. This summer we had weeks where we were catching two inches of rain, two and a half inches of rain pretty regularly. So we were able to, we, we do the herbicide around the poles, don't get me wrong, but um, not, not for the netting after we did that curtain style system, so. Quick note on the uh, chicken wire or for, t for keeping rabbits out, there is two inch and there's one inch. Mm -hmm. Two inch will keep probably 90% of your rabbits out, but the baby young rabbits can get through the two inch. So if you want to make sure nothing's yeah. getting in, we've gone with the one inch for my study because I don't want them getting in at all. So it, mm -hmm. again, a little bit more expensive, but you could get on those two inch, they can squeeze through. And this is the last item on the fencing and we'll want to make sure we'll cover some repellents and some of the lethal control options. But uh, this is kind of a repellent. This is our fencing for, um, for small seedlings and, and uh, this, well, this will work for hardwoods or uh, softwoods, but um, you can buy these, these are called tree tubes. You can buy them and they're going to protect your plants from deer grazing and other and voles and other things as well to keep them uh, growing up through the tube. They found that the trees do grow a little bit better. There's a bit of a greenhouse effect inside of there. Um, a lot of recommendations uh, if you have vole problems is keeping a circle around the bottom either sprayed and, and devoid of vegetation or even a another study has been looking at using just a shovel full of gravel that you spread around the base of there to also keep the vegetation down as if you don't want to use herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, and that also helps, to, again, that habitat component where there's no, no cover and those voles would be super exposed sitting on top of a gra bare gravel patch. They don't like to do that. Anything you want? Habitat for great, great uh, tree frogs too. Oh yeah. oh yeah, they they hang out inside of these things, yeah. Yeah, we, we put these up. This is a study on the farm here. Those are loblolly trees that are inoculated with uh, truffle spore. So it's a, it's a pH study in the field. There's 54 trees and the researcher said, I wanna plant these trees. Okay, great. When it snows eight inches or so, like we had last year, you're gonna have about this much of the only green thing around and the deer are gonna mow them off. So, you know, we put these on, but you know, when that's a, truffles are a high value crop, you know, so uh, we, we definitely made sure that we were gonna protect these, so. So back to our broader, so we covered a lot of time on fencing. I think that's a valuable place to spend quite a bit a of, time. of time. I think it's one of the useful things. I'll talk briefly about repellents. I don't wanna spend too much time on them because I think lethal control is also an important thing to talk about. So we'll zoom through a little bit on repellents. Mm -hmm. um, my colleague, who's now retired, Jonathan Kayes, did research on this uh, a couple decades ago, um, found that repellents do work. There's four categories here that he describes as when they're most, the conditions when they're most effective. If you have low to moderate deer pressure, you have light to light damage, small acreage, uh, your pell repellents aren't being used elsewhere, because if everybody's using repellents, well, then the deer will just have to hold their nose and eat it. 
And then the last one is there are alternative food sources available. So all these things play into the, how, the effectiveness of repellents. Um, but they, they do work. They tend to work two, three weeks. But they have drawbacks, uh, especially uh, after it rains. They tend to get washed off and they lose the protection. And, uh, and so you, there's a requirement for multiple applications and getting them on the ground. And there are certain repellents that can't be sprayed on food that uh, on food ready crops. So some can, some can't. So uh, there are some home remedies that people have spoken highly of. Irish spring soap. I haven't tested this, but our research, our farm manager down at the lower Eastern Shore Rec uh, swears by Irish spring soap. He uses a cheese grater and walks around plots. And he says this keeps the deer out of his research plots. Uh, again, this is a situation where these are small plots on a landscape full of soybeans and corn and all sorts of other food. So he says this works. Uh, he's an avid outdoorsman and hunter, so I, I, I think that does have some value. You can buy large things of ground, cayenne pepper, which also might help. Again, after rainfall, you need to reapply this stuff and get it out there. There are repellents like propane cannons. These kind of things are oftentimes, I think, used more for geese. Um, again, they, they can work. Things will get acclimated to them. You do have neighbor issues if you have uh, loud cannons going off as well. I'll briefly mention dog repellents. Um, these can work pretty effectively, maybe a 20, 30 acre area. They have to be out at night. If you want them to keep deer away, you have to have them out at night. So if they're dogs, if they're, they're pets and they're coming in to sleep at night, that's when your deer are doing all the damage. So they really have to be like dedicated uh, protection dogs um, to work. So uh, finally, lethal control and removal. And how are we doing on time? We've got about eight minutes. So uh, talk a bit about this. So here in Maryland, just like to talk about the legal stuff. Um, legally, uh, if you're de dealing with raccoons, skunks, and foxes, those are rabies vector species. Uh, so you're not allowed to relocate them. You either have to euthanize them or you can just move them to another part of your farm, another area, and release them, uh, which they'll probably come right back. So um, raccoons yeah. are the biggest uh, carrier of rabies here, just so everybody knows. I think maybe 80 or 90% of our raccoon, of our rabies here in Maryland are from ra are raccoons. Uh, but these other species can get them too. Um, outside of legal hunting and trapping season, you will need to get a landowner permit to, to manage, I mean, to legally do this, you need to get a permit. You can get it over the phone by calling these hotlines. And this is for um, like raccoons, uh, groundhogs and everything else. If it's, you can have a hunting license and, and, and use lethal control through a hunting license during the seasons. If, you're, if it's outside of season, outside of trapping season, you need to manage a beaver or something else, call this number. They'll give you, uh, Kevin Sullivan, they'll answer the phone. It's great, you get a live voice from a guy in Annapolis. Um, and if they, don't, if they don't answer, they will call you back. They're really good. And they'll issue a license over the phone and say, okay, you have 30 days or 60 days to get this beaver and uh, you don't have to worry about being outside of the hunting season. So uh, quickly cover that. If you don't want to do this yourself, um, there is a uh, website of wildlife, of licensed wildlife damage control operators. They have to take a little test and they, there's a whole list of them by county on this website. You can Google this and you can find people with their, their contact information and they say what they'll, the different species they're willing to deal with. So, um, and there's lots of, this is just a few, where these are all in the A's and B's and this is for I think uh, this must be Montgomery County. So managing deer populations, uh, talk a little bit about deer hunting here. Um, in terms of background, I like just to put a plug in and note that uh, hunting did is sometimes that might, some people might have a bad feeling about hunting, but it did uh, have, in our current system helps fund our DNR system and our conservation in the US. Uh, hunting licenses and firearm and ammunition, ammunition sales taxes supports 99% of Maryland DNR's budget. So hunting is sort of part of our conservation system today. Um, and so you can use hunting uh, licenses and run during those seasons, but Maryland also has uh, very liberal crop damage permits. So if you don't want to deal with hunting licenses and want to be able to take things out of season, um, this is, the, this is a, a great tool to have. Um, it allows you to harvest antlerless deer year round. So while those uh, deer damage problems really spike when they're having fawns and they have their energetic needs going up, you can 
if you're willing to, you can use these permits to take out antlerless deer. Now, it's not bucks, um, but that's fine because your antlerless deer, the females, are the ones that are driving your population. So if, you, if you're only taking out bucks, you're going to have a minimal impact on your deer densities in, in, the, uh, mm -hmm. in the area. Uh, if you don't know how to hunt, if you've never been part of your culture, there are a lot of opportunities. DNR, again, hunting licenses are part of how they are funded, so they're very interested in encouraging people to learn how to hunt. They have mentored hunt programs. They have uh, outreach programs. So they have outdoors women's program teaching women how to hunt. So there are a lot of resources there as well. So that's the sort of hunting, lethal control for deer. We also have trapping for those smaller animals. Um, uh, these box traps here are great for your raccoons, skunks. Um, they're safe to use. Um, they're easy. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else to add about that. Raccoons will just go right into these things. Sometimes you have to, they might be, you usually get the younger ones first, but eventually you can, you can get the older ones too. Um, if you have vole issues, you can use these little, it's called Sherman traps, these little box traps. Um, I'll mention you need to check these every 24 hours, I believe is the mm -hmm. law here in Maryland. Yep. So you don't have something dying in there. And sometimes if it's really hot, something, you, you might wanna check them more often. If you set them in the morning and they're out for a long, hot day, um, you could have mortality by the next morning. Um, you can also put regular mouse traps. And for voles, they create these little runways. Um, and you can actually see, if you see a little trail in the grass, uh, you can just put mouse traps in those runways and, and that will help cull your uh, vole population. For groundhogs, uh, uh, some people use conibears um, legally here in Maryland, probably because of the risk of killing non-target species. Um, they're pretty regulated. Now what a conibear trap is, it's a trap that is called a body grip trap. It's a little square and when it gets mm -hmm. tripped, it basically collapses and kills the animal right away. Um, but if a dog gets through there, it will kill a dog. So these are the types of things you gotta be really careful for. But here in Maryland, it has to be eight inches or smaller, it has to be in or under a building or in wetland areas. They're mostly designed for like wetland trapping. So um, it's not currently legal to do it over a groundhog burrow on dry land. Um, I will say though, that is the way people do do it elsewhere legally, those, uh, not those, here. Uh, have a hard box traps for work with groundhogs if you put it outside the burrow, if you put something attractive enough in there. I found they really like melons. No, oh, yeah. Melons. They really like cantaloupe, mm. or, you know, they really like that. Yep. Yeah, definitely consider your bait because, you know, you can have some of these traps, like we use a dog-proof trap around here for raccoons. They have to stick their hand down inside. They, they trip the, the trigger the dog and, you know, they get cuffed in there. If you put sardines down in there to attract uh, raccoons, you're also going to attract cats. So we try and use a mix of just corn, just bacon grease and marshmallows, bacon grease and uh, corn, something like that that's not going to attract, you know, somebody's neighborhood cat or something like that. So please keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, the Maryland DNR Trapper recommended bacon grease and marshmallows. And you like marshmallows because mm -hmm. they stay around a long time mm -hmm. and they're smelly, they're sweet, and so you don't have to lose them. Uh, it, it doesn't sort of wash away. But yes, I've also heard melons is a good attractant. And I've also heard after you catch one groundhog in one of these, the scent of that groundhog stays on that trap and they'll, they'll sort of, you can catch other ones more easily in that same trap. I'm seeing some nods from the guys in the back who, who catch a lot of groundhogs. So, uh, so in some, just briefly close, just cover where we were. We're just right on time. Mm -hmm. uh, you have habitat, vegetation options. You have your fencing, which I think is really effective for certain things. Repellents can be a tool and toolbox. And then re removal and lethal control as the final option. So mm -hmm. um, if we have any time, happy to take any questions. Here's my email and Chris's email. Feel free to email us with questions. If you want to take a survey and give us any in, uh, input or things we should have covered that you would have liked to have heard more about, uh, you can take out your phone and, and take a picture of that and it'll take you to a website. You can fill out a survey or you can go here to do that as well. So um, I'll stop there. Any, any questions? Coyotes? They're around. Yeah, we we see them.
They're around. We don't see them, but what I see yeah, is they kind of they like to walk on the plastic before you plant in it. That's about it. As I see their muddy prints on there, and you can tell because they put their back paw in the front paw print, and they have two really tight toes. It doesn't the pad doesn't spread out like a dog, but you know you can have a a pretty good sized footprint and two tight toes in the middle that are in the mud and uh you know they're, they're around i haven't seen them have you seen them on camera here uh not here i've seen them at in calvert county um they've moved into some some new places just this year so they have been for years they're, pretty sure just they're around they're, you know moving south yeah. yep yes you know, in our vicinity, and mm -hmm. he was in my water tank for the horses today. Thought it was a dog, and you know, talked to him, and it wasn't. But that couple of the neighbors have seen him also, and I've seen him. But they don't seem to be uh, like they seem to be by themselves. They don't seem to be with others, like like the wolf is always in a family mm -hmm. and movement and, and uh, a pack, and they just seem to be by themselves. Is that correct? Or yeah. Yes. Yeah, they, they, coyote, yeah. yeah, I've heard as big a group of nine calling when I've, I've been hunting for them in West Virginia. You can hear them in groups, but typically when you see them, they're alone, you which know. Is, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So. Might also be a function of how many there are in the area. Right. As, if, as the densities, as, as their population grows, you might start to see groups, but. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. I, I have the way my our little farm, we have a little farm, and I have a big plot of woods that's about eight acres in a, in a big square, mm -hmm. and I have my horses in five acres in this open space of like two acres, and then my garden, which, which is up next to my house, mm -hmm. and the way the property is long and narrow, and uh, the horses are on the level above a deer, and they just, if they come in their pasture, they give them a look, and then, so I, the deer tend to go to the neighbor's soybean field and don't come up into my garden hmm. uh, because the horses, I think, are hmm. intimidating to them, so that kind of helps. And it's free, you know, it's mm -hmm. free uh, deterrent, hmm. but I do have a problem with the little uh, rooms and that little fencing. I'm going to put that around my garden mm -hmm. and keep the rabbits out. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. Horse repellents. Oh. I need to add that to the <laughs> talk next time. That's great. I mean, it always has a burrow in there, too. You know, yeah. the, uh, um, I was just thinking about you know, urban areas where people have but one of the things you deal with are community gardens, suburban areas, and urban areas, but rats. Hmm. Depending on what people are composting, mm -hmm. rats, Interesting. And I've seen them destroy a sweet potato crop. Hmm. Well, Mm. Mm. So that's luckily if you're more rural, you're probably not going to be able to. Right, right. Right. Excellent. Thanks, Lord. Thank you. So now we're going to have Kelly.